I'm excited. Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. I'm excited to continue our conversation with Vicki Speak. She's one of the premier experts on James Strang. We're going to talk about some of the famous Strangites that uh, I'm sure you've probably heard of uh, that, that actually joined with James Strang's church. We'll also talk about a census that uh, Vicki is putting together and talk a little bit about the book of the law of the Lord that regulated polygamy within Strangism. So you won't want to miss this conversation. Check it out. So the fact that James Strang had a letter of appointment and he, he had ancient records uh, attracted a lot of people from Nauvoo. An and angelic visitation also. What's that? An angelic visitation also. And, and angelic visitation and anointing. Just like Moroni. And he didn't practice polygamy. But there were all kinds of rumors going through Nauvoo about polygamy, and there were a lot of people that were very upset about it. They did not believe in polygamy, and a lot of people didn't like Brigham Young. Right. So uh, that's, there were a lot of people who went to Boree to check it out. Can you talk about some prominent members that LDS people you would recognize? You mean like John E. Page. Okay. And William Marks. Uh-huh. And Martin Harris. Uh huh. Martin Harris, especially. Yeah. Martin Harris, yes, what actually served a Strangite mission. Right. To England. Um, I'm trying to remember Joseph Smith papers. Oh, why am I not thinking of it? Robin Jensen mm -hmm. um, had a. I think he has an ancestor who served a Strangite mission with um, Martin Harris. So that's pretty interesting. Yes, and that's what uh, Robin did his masters. For his doctorate thesis on. Oh, I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. A strang out missionary. Robin's been hard to get on. He keeps avoiding me. I don't know why. Yeah. I'm a good guy, Robin. Come on. He'll avoid you like I do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's been a long time to get you on, too. Yeah. <laughs> well, the problem that I have is the fact that it's been 20 years since I wrote my book. And it's been 20 years since I've gone over my documents. And I so I feel inadequate that I can't remember everything the way that it's supposed to be. When you first write a book, you know everything about it, and it's there with you, and you think about it all the time. But after 20 years, is You move on to this? other things. You just forget things. Right. And that's, uh, that's been the reason why I've been elusive. <laughs> but now I've been, and I've, since 2013, in the last 10 years, I've moved like five times. I know. And my files just kept getting more scattered and more scattered. I couldn't put them together. Yeah, yeah. So now we're back together now again. Back. William Smith was another prominent member. That's what I was just going to mention. Yes. William Smith and John C. Bennett. Oh, exactly. And no relation yet that I've been able to identify. <laughs> and um, George Adams. Okay. And they end up. And they ended up to be Strang's right hand men. Right. At first, Aaron Smith was the first counselor, and John E. Page was uh, one of the apostles, and William Marks was the president of the stake. For See, I didn't remember that William Marks was part of that. Wow. But when, yeah. But when the three most. Uh, abominable characters in Mormon history show up, then a lot of people cleared out. The three most abominable people are? John C. Bennett, <laughs> William Smith, and George J. Adams. Oh, wow. And they were the head. The first two I can understand. George Adams, not so much, but... Yeah, George okay. Adams, he's quite a character. Okay. Well, because one of the questions I wanted to ask you... I'll ask it kind of in two parts. Uh, for how long was James Strang supporting monogamy, and then polygamy was eventually introduced? And I know there's another set of scriptures uh, that we'll talk about here in a minute. But, so that's part one. Part two is, who do you think may have introduced Strang to the idea of polygamy? I think the two biggest... Um, culprits are probably John C. Bennett and William Smith. So I, know I think that question. they introduced 
polygamy to John to uh, Dream Strang, but in actuality, what happened is that Dream Strang fell in love. <laughs> he met just like Joseph Smith and Fanny. Alder. He met an eighteen-year-old woman, a school teacher, Elvira Fields. She was uh, not overly beautiful, but she's very handsome and healthy looking. She was extremely intelligent, probably his equal as a female in intelligence. And I think it was love at first sight. Really? He fell in love, and he knew that he could have her because Joseph Smith had more wives. Oh, so you don't think it was John Bennett or no. William Smith? No, I think oh, they were the ones that said, well, yeah, you can have her. Look at Joseph and Fanny and all the other 30 wives. Right. <laughs> And so, Strang was against polygamy until he met Elvira, and then they were, they were soulmates. What year was this approximately? Do you think? Eighteen forty-nine. Eighteen forty-nine. Is that the he same met year? her in eighteen forty-eight at a conference in Vorey. Then she went back home to Michigan, and because he was still in Wisconsin at the time. She, yes, she and her her brother and her, and her parents traveled from Michigan to Bori for a conference to check out the colony in Bori. They went back to uh, Michigan, around in the, the Jackson, Michigan area. Then they went to, they were getting ready to make plans to travel and move to Bori, but they got a message from James Strang saying, I'm taking everybody up to Beaver Island, so change your travel plans and come up to Beaver Island instead of Bori. So, was this another real estate deal? The people that got angry in Bori with James Strang made it very difficult for him to have more people come in and join his church. Uh -huh. They were called pseudos, and right. they would meet people outside of the, the town, people that were on their way to join up with James Strang, and they would meet him outside of town and say, hey, you don't want to go with this guy because of this reason, and this reason, and this reason, and they would steer them to Salt Lake. Oh, you that's know, interesting. To Brigham Young. Because, yeah, Brigham Young and James Strang mm -hmm. were big rivals. Right. I've heard that in, like, 1848-ish time frame that Strang's group was as large as Brigham Young's group. Would you agree with that? No. No? Okay. No. I think there were a lot of people interested uh, but I think that people who are trying to count the number of people who were were Strangites are counting people that were newspaper subscribers, people who would come up to visit, uh, people that expressed an interest but never really joined the organization. I've just written a paper about the, I counted the people who were on Beaver Island. This is why you were doing the census. That's why I was doing the census. And I do not think that there were as many people as it's reported. I think that it sounds great for James Strang to say, yeah, well, thousands of people up are up here, and and uh, yeah, we've got 10,000 people in here. There's no way you can put 10,000 people on that piece of property. Beaver Island. Well, not only Beaver Island, but before in Boree. Oh, okay. You can't put that many people in there. How many people do you think there were? I think that there may have been as many as 4,000 in Vori, but I think half of them left, and then uh, probably even more than half of them. I think you're talking about... When you say left, left for Beaver Island or left the church? Left Strangite Church. Okay. They decided that he was not for them. Okay. So there were 4,000 in Vori... 2,000-ish probably went to Beaver Island with him? No? 500. Oh, is that Between all? Between 500 and 800. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. That's how many there were on Beaver Island. Okay. Oh, it's a lot smaller than I expected. Me too. So I used to say there was 1,500, but I counted them. And now it's 500? Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. There's between 500 and 800. Wow, that's interesting. Breaking news. <laughs> um, coming up in the next JWHA journal. Oh, really? Is it coming well, up? A couple of 
couple of issues away. See, look, we, I love the previews that we get. Uh-huh. Um, so would you say, because I, I know Brighamites aren't your, your focus, were Brighamites 10,000 or 4,000? Do you have any sense for what they were in 1848? I thought it was more like... Uh, like ten thousand, between ten and twelve thousand okay. in Nauvoo. So, but a lot of them stayed there with the RLDS church, or I guess the Strangite church. That was because the RLDS church didn't exist in eighteen forty-eight. Right, and the Strangites were the ones that organized that made the RLDS church. Yeah, basically. William Marks and yeah others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. But you did have more Brighamites in Boston, and in Baltimore, and Philadelphia, you know, in Kirtland. And so forth. So there were, there were a lot of people outside of Nauvoo, and they, they just stayed the same. They didn't change the name of their religion. They just stayed the same. They believed the same way that they always did. I know John Hamer has said uh, concerning these outer groups, Kirtland, Boston, places like that, that. Um, if Strangite came, Strangite missionaries came, then they were kind of supported the Strangites, and then when Brighamite missionaries came, they supported the Brighamites. Mm -hmm. Like, there wasn't really a, a strong affiliation for either group. No. Um, they were just interested in what's going on out west, <laughs> whether that was in Vari or, or Salt Lake. But most of the people who came in at first with the Strangites were members of Joseph Smith's church. And Strang said, well, I'm the successor of Joseph Smith's church, so they don't have to be baptized in my church. He just accepted the baptism that happened in Joseph Smith's church. So you can't count them. It's very difficult to do that. Okay. And so, but so, so you think the Brigham Young group was as big as 10,000 and the James Strang group was as small as 500? Well, on Beaver Island, but in Boree, I think that maybe... About 2,000. About 2,000. So, so Brigham Young group was probably at least three times bigger. Mm -hmm. Okay. But then again, I'm going to take another look at that as far as how many members were in the far cities. And assign them to Brigham or Strang, basically? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're, you're a, a demo, demographer, a census taker. I, all of a sudden, I've become a demographer. <laughs> and I have, no, I have no knowledge of economics, but I'm learning. <laughs> Well, I'm a statistician if you need any help. Is so that right? Let me know, yeah. So, uh, well, cool. So, right. you asked me about uh, Charlie Douglas. Or, yes, uh, yes. Elvira. She went up to Beaver Island, and she, with her family, and she ran into uh, James Strang again. They got to know each other pretty well, and he sent his missionary, his delegate, George J. Adams, to Elvira, saying that the Lord has decided that the saints can practice polygamy and that she would have the honor of being the first plural wife of the Strangite prophet. Now, because I've always heard that um, James Strang translated the book of the law of the Lord, and mm -hmm. that was where polygamy was made legal or whatever. I was probably not saying it very well, but um, so that is that at the same time as Elvira? Yes. He was translating the law of the Lord at the same time that he was that he was getting to know uh, Elvira Field. Okay, and so. Um, you, I guess you could argue this was a convenient revelation. It was a little different than the Vori plates, though. Yes. What, what were the differences? We don't know where they came from. He never told. He never said where that he got them. He just said that he had these plates and he was being translated. That they were given to him, and I know that they were carried around by one of his followers in a suitcase for a long time, and then uh, they. James Strang went out on on Beaver Island on an abandoned ship and translated them on the ship uh, during about uh, 1850, 1851. And had he already married Elvira by yes. this time? He had Secretly. already married Elvira. So, so, he had, so he was a polygamist before he got this official yes. revelation? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. He was going to go to some conferences 
in the East during the winter uh, missionary season, and he wanted her to go with him. So they were married on Beaver Island on July 8th, 1849. I'm impressed that you know these dates so well. Well, July 8th happens to be King's Day, the day that he would later be court, uh, crowned king. Oh, okay. He chose her birthday. That was Elvira's birthday. It was her birthday. And that was the day that they were married. It was uh -huh. on her birthday. Then he wanted her to go with them, to, uh, to go with him on the mission. So, somehow he conveyed it so that she, her hair was cut, and she traveled in men's clothing as his 16-year-old nephew, Charles Douglas. And she was 18, 19 at the time, probably? She was 18, uh-huh. Okay, so you're 19 16, years 18. old. And uh, did she grow any whiskers or anything? To no, she hide didn't. Her boyish looks, <laughs> or her girlish looks, please. And apparently, her disguise was not really that great either, because <laughs> a lot of people saw through it. Oh, okay. And this is what I liked, because at JWHA there were several uh, Kyle Bashirs. Actually, we talk about this in great detail, uh -huh. um, so we don't have to go into too much detail. But yeah, so. Elvira Fields is the same as Charlie Douglas. Yes. And Charlie wrote a lot of like doctrine and exposition. On he the wrote he wrote newspaper articles for the newspaper. He kept the minutes of all the conferences. Uh, I think that he may have even participated in priesthood ordinances. Oh, really? Because do do Strangites ordain women to the priesthood now? Yes, they do. Okay. And there was a priesthood uh, office called teacher okay. that women were anointed to or ordained to later on. And it's is in the that the only of the priesthood law. office? Uh, that's the only one that I know of for women that I can recall. But uh, there are several women. So at was least Charlie a teacher, uh, ordained a teacher? No, I don't know. I know that one of his other later wives was, but I don't know that she was ordained a teacher because he didn't have the Book of the Law at that time. Oh, okay. But you think Charlie participated in priesthood ordinances like baptism? I don't know why not. If he's got the priesthood at 16 years old. So could have, could have been a priest as early as age 16? Slash 18. <laughs> so it's possible, you know, anointing the sick if they're on a mission, the two of them. Mm -hmm. And people ask for a blessing. And there's two of them there. So I, I don't know, maybe. I haven't seen anything that really says definitely. Do, do Strangites follow the same uh, priest, Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthood as the LDS? Especially at this time? They do, but the offices are a little bit different. Okay. They're just rearranged, I think. You know, like, uh, now you're asking me about theology. And I'm not very good at theology. <laughs> so I'm not really sure about the priesthood offices. Okay. But I do know that at one time there were some men who stood up and said they had news from Beaver Island that they wanted to share with everybody about James Strang and supposedly, and his nephew, and and uh, they wanted to blurt some news out that they had heard from their wives. And Charlie took notes during that session, during that conference. What was this news, was it? The news was supposed to be that, his, that he was traveling with a woman. <laughs> and Charlie wrote and that down. And she kept her composure and as a man and kept notes. <laughs> And so did they? So James Strang was traveling with a woman, but they didn't know that Charlie Douglas was the woman. It was, most people suspect it, but they didn't dare mention it. Oh, so they were just hoping by implication that Charlie would out himself. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. but that didn't happen. And I know that another session, uh, Strang ordained a black man to the priesthood while he was with Charlie. Was that Joseph Ball? That was uh, Moore Walker. Oh, I haven't heard of Moore Walker. Mm -hmm. Is that related? No, that wouldn't be related to Q. Walker Lewis, no. No, he was a black man, yeah. Okay. 
So as early as 1848, 49, 49 mm -hmm. Strang ordained a black man. Do we know the priesthood office? That's a theology question. A theology, I don't remember that. Okay. It's, it's, you know, it's like me in numbers. You know, what's, what's two, three zeros after a number, you know? <laughs> I don't care. 500, 5,000. Well, yeah. 100 <laughs> bucks, a million bucks, I don't know. <laughs> I can remember names, but I can't remember numbers. Okay, okay. All right, so, uh, all right, so, Book of the Law of the Lord, if I remember, and I'm trying to remember, I think this is right, but and let's see if you can remember. It seems like these plates were given to, to James Strang, and then when he translated them, they became the Book of the Law of the Lord, and then the mm -hmm. plates were given back to the angel. Does nope. that sound right to you? No? They just, they, they just appeared. He didn't really say where they went. Oh, okay. He, he just, never said where he got them. So he never said an angel brought them to him? No. Oh, so they're just, just plates Yeah, he just said he got the plates, but he never told anybody how he got them. Oh. And he never told anybody what happened to him. Just that he had them, and he translated them, and supposedly they were the lost record that was carried in the Ark of the Covenant. So, that's all we know. Okay. Are these the only other plates that he translated, or were there more? There were two sets. There was the, the, the plates of Bori, you know, of Bori, and then the, the Law of the Lord. Okay. So, it was just those two sets. And so, those are important Strangite scriptures Very. now. I, was it the Book of the Law of the Lord that also laid down Saturday as the yes. day of worship? Yes. It has uh, rules and regulations. Uh, for how to live. It talks about polygamy. It talks about how to treat uh, your servants and your fellow men. Uh, each, they have different about what to eat, uh, about how... Because they don't eat pork, do they? Uh, they? I believe they eat pork. Oh, they do? Yeah, I think so. But it's just supposed to be a healthy diet and uh, just... Uh, the way that things were supposed to be set up in the in the town and and in the religious organization is organizational. Yeah. And there was another set of really important records called the the Beaver Island Record that kept a record of the people who were sealed together as families. Oh, so they did temple sealings as well. They did. And they also sealed, sometimes the family was sealed to another man, a priesthood leader, the way that they did it in the LDS church. Like a, the law of adoption kind of a thing, is that what you're saying? Yes, the law of adoption. They were adopted into James Strang's family to be his son forever. So these are non-relatives being adopted as a, as a, mm -hmm. a son in the right. next life, essentially. Mm-hmm. Was that the same reasoning? Because I know in the LDS church um, during this time, people were concerned that their parents reje had rejected the LDS church, and so they were, you know, the same spirit which exhibits this life will experience the next. So they wanted to be sealed to Joseph Smith or Brigham Young or uh, Heber Kimball or whoever, mm -hmm. um, so that they would be able to be sealed because they were worried their parents were going to reject the gospel in the next life. So it was the same idea. Mm -hmm. did, were they, did they build a temple um, for these ceilings and that sort of thing? They did not have a temple, but they tried to build a tabernacle. But they had so much persecution from the Gentiles on Beaver Island that it was never finished. Oh, so they did start a temple. Mm -hmm. Did they do any endowments or anything like that? No. Okay. It was mostly, it was just, uh, they did blessings of babies they did ceilings of families together including dead relatives and there was a list of baptisms and there's also a list of people that had already been baptized in the joseph smith's church in that record i hope you enjoyed our conversation with author and historian vicky speak she's the author of god hath made us a kingdom in our next conversation, we're going to talk a little bit about Strangite temples and get into a little bit of John C. Bennett as well. 
Well, you're talking about the Bori days again, and there were a lot of pseudos there who just did not like him, and they, they said, uh, get rid of these guys, get rid of William Smith and John C. Bennett, because they're causing division in your church, and uh, they're trying to to uh, to cause problems here. Get rid of them, and apparently James Strang listened to him. Okay. If you like what we're doing here on Gospel Tangents, please become a paid subscriber at gospeltangents.com or patreon.com slash gospeltangents. We've got full transcripts on our website at gospeltangents.com. And if you'd like to check out some of our other conversations, click over here. Thanks.